you Let's everybody go. for coming. Mr. De Silva and I worked together years ago at the Museum of Science. And since we worked together, he's gone on and done amazing, cool things. He wrote a great book and he was kind enough to come in today and talk to all of you. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to him. If you have questions that you'd like me to ask him, you can put it in the chat and I'll, I'll go ahead and ask on his behalf. And then I'll just turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, it is so good to see you again. Um, we worked many years ago, um, and some of the work that we did together inspired what I what I do now. Um, we we went to New York and helped excavate a mastodon from a, a, a pond in Hyde Park, New York, um, which was one of my first paleontological experiences, um, and it it really you know inspired me and and uh, sent me on this this fun career path. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for inviting me to your, to your class. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about, about what I do um, and the research that I do and the questions I ask and the, the, the travel that I get to do when there is not a global pandemic. Um, and then I'd like to just open it up for questions and, and hear what you're interested in. So I'm a, I'm a kind of scientist called a paleoanthropologist. So if we break that word apart, paleoanthropology, the paleo part is paleontology, so I study fossils, and the anthropology part uh, is the study of humans. So I study human fossils. So each year um, I travel to Africa, usually Eastern Africa, Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia, uh, or South Africa, and I search for fossilized remains of our ancient ancestors to try to figure out how we got to be the way we are today. I'm mostly interested in the way we move. Uh, humans move in a very strange way for a mammal. Most mammals move on all fours and humans just walk around on two legs. And it's a very peculiar way to, to move around the world. Um, it makes us slow. We're slower than most animals out there. It makes us quite unstable and vulnerable to injury. And so it's a very curious thing to a lot of scientists of, of why did this evolve? Why did this happen? And so that's what I study. I study human, human evolution. Um, we know, for instance, from studying the DNA of humans and of our close living relatives uh, that we are, we are most closely related to chimpanzees and bonobos. This is a chimpanzee right here. And this is what my skull would look like. These are both plastic. And we can tell from those DNA similarities that we last share an ancestor way back in time that lived about 7 million years ago. And so then as scientists, we saw, well, well, how do we know that? And can we go and find evidence for that? And that's where the fossils come in. So we look in geological formations, rock formations that have been dated back uh, 2 million, 3 million, 4, 5, 6, even 7 million years old, and search for what these ancient ancestors looked like and how they evolved independently into, into humans today uh, and into chimpanzees in a completely different direction. So in a moment, I'll take you around my lab to show you some of those fossils. Um, but for the next few minutes, um, I'm just gonna tell you that, that when I was your age, um, I was fascinated by science, I loved science, um, but I didn't know anything about, about paleontology or anything about uh, anthropology, certainly. Um, I went to college to study astronomy. Um, I never took a, a, an anthropology class when I was in college. So it was after college that I even discovered my path. Um, and so a lot of you in the coming years are gonna think you need to have your, your life course all mapped out. Um, and you really don't. You can take your time trying to figure out what it is that you wanna do um, and, and, and discover that thing that makes you really passionate about your work. Um, and then once you find that thing, you know, pursue it as, as hard as you can. Um, I discovered paleoanthropology when I was working with your teacher at the Museum of Science in Boston. Um, we had uh, an exhibit on these ancient footprints from a site called uh, uh, Liatoli, which is in Tanzania, of something moving on two legs like we do. But it was positioned very close to the dinosaur exhibit. And I was concerned that visitors might see that as a misconception that humans and dinosaurs coexisted because we know they didn't. We can tell from the fossils that they absolutely did not, unless you consider birds to be dinosaurs, right? Uh, birds still, still live today and so, so do humans. Um, and so I asked to move that exhibit up to our human biology exhibit. And my boss at the time said, well, if we're gonna do that, you need to learn everything you can about human evolution. And so I went to the library and I pulled out this book right here. It's called From Lucy to Language, 
by Don Johansson. And I was hooked, not necessarily on the words. Um, I'm a very visual learner. Um, I loved the images. I loved the pictures of these old bones, right? And, and, and these artifacts that researchers find and the stories that the researchers were able to, to tell about our ancestors on the basis of these, these old fragmentary fossils. Um, and I was hooked. I was absolutely hooked. I became obsessed with ancient fossils. Um, and I eventually left the museum to go to graduate school uh, to study this. I started in Boston at Boston University and then went to the University of Michigan um, for, for my, my graduate work. Uh, and then eventually came back to, to New England. I, I grew up in Massachusetts. Um, I grew up in the southern part of the state, close to Rhode Island. Um, and it, it really has been, it's been great to, to come back with, um, with my, my wife, who I also met at the Science Museum, uh, to come back to, uh, to New England uh, and continue to do this work uh, here in New England. So let me, let me take you around the lab a little bit, and then hopefully uh, you have some questions. Um, so, so we are a very visual science. We've got lots of, of, um, of bones that, that we handle and talk and measure and think about. Uh, this is a monkey skeleton right here. And here we have a skeleton of an, of an ape. This is a skeleton of a gibbon. And we know it's an ape because it doesn't have a tail. So monkeys have tails, apes don't have tails, which makes us kind of an ape, right? We don't have a tail. We can lift our arms above our head and I like to eat fruit. So that makes me sort of an, sort of an ape, right? Um, uh, the other apes would be chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and gibbons. Some of those apes start walking on two, on two legs. That happens around 7 million years ago. Uh, and we find fossilized remains back in Central Africa of um, evidence that, that, that something is moving on two legs, which is a characteristic, again, of our lineage. Um, these here are, go back 4 million years, 3 million years. And then we keep going in time to, to 2 million years. These are about 2 million years as well. These are all found in South Africa. So Eastern Africa and South Africa are the central spots for human evolution. These here, we start experiencing brain enlargement around 2 million years ago in our own genus, what we would call the genus Homo. So these are what we would call Homo erectus. Um, and Homo erectus is really cool. They have all these long legs and they start migrating out of Africa. They leave Africa, not completely, they spread out throughout Africa, but then they also expand their territories into Europe and into Asia. Um, so these are some of the fossils we find in Asia. We find them in China, in Indonesia, and they're about a million, million and a half years old, but they're not us yet. These are still what we would call Homo erectus. And in Europe, these are some of the fossils that are found in Europe. They evolve even larger brains and bigger faces, and we would call those Neanderthals. But back home in Africa, we start finding fossils around a quarter of a million years ago of things that are pretty indistinguishable from you and I. And this is our own species, Homo sapiens. And Homo sapiens then spreads out, expands its territory uh, all over the world, right? Into Europe, into Asia, where they would have bumped into Neanderthals and some of the previous inhabitants of those areas. And what we can tell by studying the DNA of Neanderthals and DNA of you and I is that we interbred with those other populations. We, we made babies with them. And so we absorbed their genes into our own gene pool. So everyone here, everyone listening, you're, you've got some Neanderthal in you and you've got some uh, genetics from a population in Asia that we call the Denisovans. Uh, and the Denisovans are, are probably a late occurring Homo erectus uh, population. And so we're sort of a, a melting pot species that yes, we emerged from Africa and then absorbed all these other populations into our gene pool as we spread all over the globe as this wildly successful uh, upright walking primate. Um, of course, there are now 7 billion of us. Uh, and these are some of the fossils that we have of Homo sapiens through a time period called the Pleistocene, the last ice age, and then into our current uh, epoch, the, the, the Holocene. Um, although, although our evolutionary journey continues, uh, we still exhibit some changes today uh, compared to some of those some of those specimens. Oh, so those are just skulls, right? But I study upright walking. And so we also have lots and lots and lots of, fo of fossils in these drawers down below of, um, of skeletons. 
And so the one I'm showing you right now is a very famous skeleton by the name of Lucy. And Lucy was discovered in Ethiopia in the 1970s. And she's named Lucy because when the researchers found her, they were very, very excited about this. And they played the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds over and over and over again, and then nicknamed her Lucy. She lived a little over 3 million years ago. She had a brain that was only slightly larger than a chimpanzee's, but we can tell from her pelvis and from her leg bones and from her foot bones that she could walk on two legs much the same way that you and I do. So we can tell from the fossils that walking on two legs is one of the most ancient things that separates us from our ape relatives. Our brain enlargement, our technology, our artistic abilities, our language, these are things that came later in our evolutionary history. Upright walking is, is what happened first. It's what started this, 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 whole, this whole process. We're still trying to figure out why. It's one of the great questions that we have in, in our science is, is why did we start moving on two legs given some of the downsides, given the fact that it makes us slow and it makes us vulnerable uh, to getting eaten by, by predators. And there were predators. It's the last fossil I'll show you for now. And then I'd love to take questions and hear what you're interested in learning about. Um, when we go to a fossil site, we find we're lucky if we find a fossil of an early human. They're very, very rare. What we find most of the time are fossils of other animals. We find fossils of zebras and, and wildebeest and warthogs and baboons and giraffes and elephants. And these fossils are, are of, of ancestors of those modern animals. So there are slight differences between those ancient uh, elephants and zebras and giraffes and wildebeest and the ones that live today because they've evolved too. But we also find fossils of things that no longer exist like this. This is called a homotherium. It's a big saber-toothed cat. So this thing would have been bigger than a lion. So this huge, huge predator would have been larger than a lion, right? Can fit my head in there. Um, and it roamed the same landscapes that our ancestors did. And we know that because we find their fossils next to each other. And sometimes we find fossils with evidence of interaction between the two. So this is a fossil from South Africa. It's the back of a skull. So it would go back here on me. And it has, if I hold it up to the camera here, it has two puncture marks, two holes, right in the back of the skull. And what that tells us is something like this ate something like this, okay? So we were food. We were on the menu for these sorts of things. Uh, so it took, it took a lot of cooperation. It took a lot of looking out for each other uh, on, the, on this landscape uh, in order for us to survive and, and continue on. Um, of course, there are ways that we can protect ourselves today uh, from predation events, even though those things still happen. They still happen. They're, I've had a couple of close calls myself um, in places in, in, in Africa. Um, and so it's important to recognize that we were, were part of the landscape and we continue to be part of the landscape um, throughout, uh, throughout history and that shaped, our, that shaped our evolution. So um, who has questions? Hi, Jeff, uh, Jerry. Um, one of my students was asking how and where you were able to find all of the skeleton uh, and skulls behind you. Mm. So I wish I could take credit for all this. Um, I, can, I cannot. Uh, I've found some of these, but most of them have been found by my colleagues um, through time. What you're looking at around me um, is the result of about a hundred years of, of research. Um, we've been finding fossils in Africa for, for it's actually exactly a hundred years. The very first fossil of an ancient human ever discovered in Africa was found in the country of Zambia. Um, and it's this one right here. It was found in June of 1921, and that's a hundred years ago. 
And it was found by miners who were looking for iron and, and, and lead deposits. Um, and they were hitting through this cave wall and they discovered this amazing skull. And this skull is a lot like, like humans today. It's got a brain size about the same size as mine, um, but the face is much, much bigger. Big brow ridge across the top. Um, it doesn't have much of a forehead. I've got this big forehead and this, and this one doesn't. Um, and so the point here is that we've been finding fossils for 100 years. Um, and there are literally thousands of fossils that we have discovered. But we're talking about time periods in the millions of years. And a million is a thousand thousand. So even if you have a couple of thousand fossils, you still only have a fossil per every few thousand years. So imagine if you know, one of your students uh, you know, donates their jaw to science, and that's the only fossil we have for the last few thousand years of existence. We'd be missing a lot of information. And so that's why when we find new fossils, it's really exciting to us. And we celebrate these new discoveries because they help us fill in pieces of the puzzle that we didn't have. So every year we go out and we search for more of these things. Um, we go to places where we know fossils are. So that's a good starting point is you know fossils have been found at a spot. So you start there. And if you don't find anything, you expand your search radius. You go farther out from that central spot and look for fossils in fresh deposits that maybe haven't been searched as well. We're now relying very heavily on, um, on, on uh, uh, images that are taken from drones. So we'll fly drones over landscapes and see, uh, we can teach computers to sort of say, okay, we've had success finding fossils at these places. So please find more places like that. And so we'll get back this information of you should look here, 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 and here. Um, one of the best examples of this is a colleague of mine who used Google Earth. And you've probably all you know, used Google Earth and maybe you look for your school or you look for your own home. Um, and this researcher looked over a landscape looking for caves. And he was able to find with Google Earth, he was able to find 300 caves that nobody had known about before. And one of those, produced that skeleton that's standing behind me right now uh, that was discovered about 10 years ago of what's called an Australopithecus, lived about 2 million years ago. An incredible discovery made because of, of Google Earth. So we're, we're using all sorts of fun technologies now to try to, to, try to find uh, these fossils, and we're getting better at it. So the pace of discovery is picking up. We have a bunch of questions in the chat. I also see Ms. Giblin. Did you want to ask a question? Or do you want me to read yours? That's okay. I put it in the chat, but I'll read it. Um, the fossil the, of the full skeleton that's standing beside, behind you is two different colors. Yes. Can you explain that? Yes, absolutely. So the, the tan color is what we discovered. That's what we found. And the white is what we have not found yet, but we will. Um, so you can see, for instance, that we found one side of the pelvis here, but not the other side. Thankfully, humans and chimps and gorillas and primates and mammals in general are, are bilaterally symmetrical, meaning, you know, by each side, lateral, you know, so two for by lateral side, uh, symmetrical. So if you know the left side, you're going to know the right side and we can mirror image. And that's what we've done. But we've got the right arm here. We didn't find the left arm, but you can mirror image it. There are some pieces that we still haven't found of this particular species. We don't have the bone in the throat called the hyoid, for instance, that would tell us about language abilities. So that's gonna be a really useful one when we find, find it. But lots of other parts of the skeleton are represented. A lot of the foot, however, is not. And that's unfortunate for somebody like me who studies upright walking. But what's great about this site in South Africa, uh, it's a cave site called Malapa. Um, we have found more chunks of rock that contain fossils and we CT scan them. We put, sent them through a, a CT scanner and inside those images, we see some of the missing pieces to the skeleton. So we're gonna have more of this skeleton uh, in, the, in the coming months, if not coming, coming years. Um, and that reminds me to, to show you what, how, what sort of state fossils are in when we first find them. Um, this here is a chunk of rock that 
is um, similar to how we find these fossils. And in it, you might be able to see, if I hold it just right up to the camera, that there's a row, uh, uh, there's some teeth in there. You see the roots coming down, and then there's the top of the tooth. So this is a real fossil here from South Africa, and it's embedded within this brown and red stuff. And this, this stuff is really difficult to, to get through. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll find a fossil like this, and then under a microscope, we use these little mini jackhammers to slowly grain by grain remove the rock from surrounding the surrounding fossil. Um, and that's traditionally how we've done this, but we're starting to explore new ways. Um, so what we could also do is take that rock, CT scan it, and then on a computer, digitally remove the fossil from the surrounding rock and then print it out with a 3D printer. And that's what's happened with this fossil here. This is a fossil that is in South Africa right now, but the researchers um, scanned it and then sent me a file and I just printed it out with our 3D printer. And now I have this fossil, it's a fossil heel bone that I can start to work on and start to describe uh, right here in my lab in, in New Hampshire, uh, even though the fossil itself is in South Africa. So we're starting to use these new methods now of, of uh, not just discovery of the fossils, but, but of preparation uh, of them so that we can study them and figure out what they tell us about us. Thank you. We have another question from Ms. Colucci. Did you want to ask Ms. Colucci? If not, I have a bunch more in the chat too. Yeah, um, we just wanted to know, um, to go on the archaeological digs, how do you get the money for that? Like, where does, where does the money come from for that? The great question. It's a great question. Um, it's difficult to get money to support this research. Um, there are private foundations. Uh, there's a foundation called the Leakey Foundation that's named after a very famous uh, paleontological family, the Leakey family, Mary Leakey, Louis Leakey, Maeve Leakey, Richard Leakey. Uh, Louis, Louise Leakey is now continuing this work. Anyway, uh, lots of private donations go to that, that foundation and they give grants for good ideas. So I sent them a grant uh, proposal about four months ago, asking them for money to go to Tanzania to dig at a site that has all those footprints of early humans. Um, we went there in 2019, made some more discoveries of fossilized footprints, and I want to go back there because um, I, I want to follow those footprints out and dig where I think they would, they would merge together into a group, and I want to find more of those footprints. And so I asked them for $25,000, and that would support airfare for me and some students, it would support uh, food and travel while we're there, uh, tents, um, and some of the permits that it would take us uh, to work with our Tanzanian colleagues at this site. There's also the National Science Foundation. The National Science Foundation is a, um, a, a part of the United States government. And so when people pay their taxes, some money gets set aside for the National Science Foundation. And then you can apply to them with your good ideas for how you should uh, discover more things about the world, and they then decide whether you have earned that money. The problem is that 90% of people who apply to the National Science Foundation get turned down, 90%. And it's because they don't have enough money uh, for, for science research. It used to be much more, um, but science research is getting cut over and over and over again with each uh, consecutive budget. Uh, and so it's harder and harder and harder for us to, to continue to do our work. Uh, the last place to get money is from your home institution. And so I, I teach at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. It's a private uh, school um, and, and they have an embarrassing amount of money. Um, there, are, there are alumni that have gone to Wall Street and made gazillions of dollars and then they give a lot of that money back to their college. Uh, and so that's money that we uh, can tap into a little bit. And so I'm very fortunate uh, that I can tap into some of that. Um, and they can support my research that way. Uh, but not every college is, is, is like that. Thank you. Another question I have in the chat is the students want to know what other countries or continents you've been to other than Africa? So, yeah, I spend most of my research time in Africa. Um, I mean, I have spent some time in Europe. Uh, one, of the, one of the neat things about, about human evolution is that um, our ancestors didn't care what continent they were on. They were just trying to follow food. 
And so if you happen to follow food through the Middle East, you're going to find yourself in Europe and Asia at some point. And that did happen at certain times in our evolutionary past. And so we find fossils of ancient apes even in France and Spain and Germany and Italy and Greece. Apes used to live in, in around the Mediterranean in Southern Europe. And so uh, I've done some work in Germany uh, looking for ancient ape fossils that are uh, uh, about 12 million years old. And that's gonna tell us about the ancestral ape from which the African apes may have uh, evolved. So I've spent some time in Europe, um, very little time in Asia, no time at all in Australia, which I'm, I'm dying to go to Australia. Um, and then one of the worst places to live if you um, happen to uh, uh, study human evolution is New England. Um, and yet here we find ourselves. Um, it was one of the last places that, that humans got to as they expanded uh, over the Bering Strait from Asia into the Americas and then spread out in the Americas. Um, and yet during COVID, I found myself doing some local projects. Uh, we we uh, in Vermont have a couple of archeological sites, uh, including one site that has some mammoth bones uh, that we've been working on and, and dating. Um, but that's a long winded way to say that I do most of my work in Africa because that's where the majority of human evolution happened. Uh, so South Africa, these cave sites in South Africa, and then these ancient lakeshore uh, environments in Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, and now Tanzania is, is, um, is where I, I do most of my work in Eastern Africa these days is Tanzania. So I'll be going back to Tanzania this summer um, to continue excavations there. COVID another, willing. <laughs> another student asked, um, what changed the most from earliest man to present day homo sapiens and what what didn't change so what changed the most and what changed the least yeah so most things didn't change um we have five digits just like chimpanzees do we have a four chambered heart just like chimpanzees do we have the exact same number of teeth that other apes have and and other monkeys that live in africa and asia have they have 32 teeth in their mouth and they're distributed in the same way of incisors and canines and bicuspid teeth and molars, exactly as yours and I, mine are. They're just these subtle differences in shape. Um, and, and I'll show you another example of this. Um, chimpanzees, we sometimes think, have hands for their feet because they can climb so well. Um, this is a human foot, and this is a chimpanzee foot. They have the exact same 26 bones in their feet that we do, exact same. And they have two feet like we do. So they have 52 bones in their feet, just like we do. And the bones, bone for bone, they're the same, the same bones. They're just shaped a little bit differently. Tiny little shape differences accumulating over the whole body give us these differences in posture, standing on two legs rather than, say, knuckle walking like a chimpanzee. Um, Subtle differences in, in how genes are expressed in the genome give us our larger brains compared to, say, a chimpanzee. I would say the bone that has changed the most, though, is the pelvis. So this is a chimpanzee pelvis, and this is a human pelvis. And you hopefully can see the similarities, but then there are these huge differences. The chimpanzee pelvis is much taller, and the human pelvis is much shorter and squatter, okay? And that's because we walk on two legs and having a short squat pelvis lowers our center of mass and it allows us to balance much more effectively than a chimpanzee's. And then I can show you Lucy's pelvis. Lucy, again, lived about 3 million years ago. So we can see her pelvis here, it's shaped like ours, right? It's that short squat pelvis, just like what we have. So that's the sort of shape differences that tell us that she could walk on two legs like we do and didn't knuckle walk like a chimpanzee, right? So those are all bone differences, right? But honestly, when I compare myself to a chimpanzee, and I have had the chance and the, and the great fortune of spending some time with chimpanzees in, in the forest, um, chimpanzees don't have language. They don't, they don't think about the, the future and they don't, they don't wonder about their own existence the way we do. They don't sit in science class and try to figure out how the world works. Um, 
they uh, they also don't have any art. Um, they don't make jewelry. They don't. There's no body adornment. Um, they don't wear clothing. There there are all these things that make humans the way we are in in how we sort of express ourselves individually. Um, and and are, we're so creative. Um, and we're also amazing problem solvers. Um, you know, there are a lot of problems in the world right now, but but uh, humans are incredible problem solvers. I have great hope uh, for for humans looking back in the past at how our ancestors solved problems in the past. Um, I, I think we're good at it. We're really good at it uh, compared to say um, our, our close ape relatives. So, you know, those are some of the big differences. There's some anatomical ones, sure. Uh, bigger brains, we walk on two legs, uh, but the behavioral ones I think are much more um, important to our survival. Our language, our ability to share ideas, uh, and, and, our, and our incredible curiosity and our, our remarkable uh, imagination and creativity. I think we have time for one more question. And one that has been coming up a lot in the chat is students want to know how you know where to find these fossils and what those habitats look like. I don't know if they mean modern habitat or what it looked like millions of years ago when these species lived, but they're asking a lot, like, how do you know where to find fossils? Yeah, it's, it's incredibly hard. I mean, I've been at a fossil site where we've searched and searched and searched and searched for days and we find nothing. Um, and we give up on a site like that and you go to the next site, but you only give up on a site like that for a couple of years because you, the best tool for a paleontologist is rain. Rain will slowly wash away ancient sediments and dig for you and expose bones that are buried in, in that landscape. So you wanna go back every couple of years and check out that fossil site uh, to make sure that the rains haven't washed out a Lucy, like a new skeleton that was, that was just beyond your vision the time before because it was still buried. Um, so so we, we go to fossil sites usually following the advice of geologists. Geologists are really interested in how the earth works and how over time rocks have formed. So geologists will go to places like the Great Rift Valley in Africa, where the earth is literally ripping apart. And it's ripping apart at the same rate that your hair is growing. So it's very, very slowly, um, but you give it five, 10 million years and you create a gash in the earth that's about 20 miles wide. And what that does is it rips open and exposes these ancient sediments. So the geologists are out there studying this area and then they will report back that an area has fossils. And once we hear that, that an area has fossils, that makes us super interested. And we will then go to a place like that with permission from uh, uh, the, the local government uh, and with partners uh, from that country uh, and search the area for fossils. And sometimes you get lucky and you find something, but most of the time you don't. Um, so paleontology is a science of, of failure. You have to get used to not finding things, uh, but it means when you do find something, oh, it's just, it's absolutely thrilling. And sometimes you're not the one to make the discovery. So last quick story, that amazing skeleton back there that, that I said, you know, we discovered, the very first pieces of this skeleton that we discovered were the collarbone right here, and the lower jaw right here, and they were stuck in a rock that a nine-year-old kid tripped over. So the kid trips over a rock. He was there with his father, who was a paleoanthropologist like I am, and he said, hey, dad, I found some fossils. And his dad came over, assuming they're going to be zebra fossils or antelope fossils, and they were fossils of early humans. And we could tell from, especially from that canine tooth, because humans have very small fang teeth. And so we knew right away that this was an ancient human. Um, and then from this initial discovery, we got, we got an almost complete skeleton. And so these discoveries are sometimes made completely accident, accidentally. And hey, we'll, we'll take them any way we can get them. Um, it's so rare to find these fossils. Uh, and, and when we do, we, we are, we're thrilled, um, not just because they are fossils of our ancestors, but then the information they contain is gonna tell us about the great journey that, that, that we've taken to, to get here. Thank you so much. This was so informative. It's great to see your lab. It's great to see you. Um, I'm getting messages in the chat.
interesting. There's a sitting blossom. So we'll Thank you. All right. And if there are more questions, uh, you know how to get in touch with me. So feel free to send them along. Thank you. All right. Thank you.